Diana Norma, a noble panel, Duccio Maesta in Diana Norman, edition Siena, Florence, and Perdua. Oh, I'm sorry, Padua, pages 55 to 80. Chapter 3, a noble pano, panel, Duccio's Maesta. On June 9, 1311, Duccio Maesta, plate 65 and 60, was carried in triumphant from the painter's workshop to its place over the high altar of Siena Duomo. The lively description of the event given by an anonymous mid-14th century Sienese chronicler conveys something of the intensity, celebratory nature of this occasion and the enthusiastic reception that Duccio's painting was revived. On the day on which it was carried to Duomo, the shops were locked up and the bishop ordered a great devout company of priests and brothers with a solemn procession accompanied by the signora of the nine and all the officials of the commune <clears throat> and all the populace and they accompanied it right to the du Duomo making procession round the campo as was the custom sounding all the bells in the glory out of devotion for such noble panel as was this. Some 250 years later, Giorgio Vasari, writing in the second edition of his famous Lives of the Artists, remarked of Duccio. In Duomo, he executed a panel which was put on the high altar and afterwards removed. It was painted on both the back and the front as the high altar stood out by itself, and the back, Duccio had executed with great care all the principal histories of the New Testament in the very small figures. I have endeavored to discover where this panel is located at this present time, but although I have taken much care, I have not succeeded in finding it. By 1568, Duccio's monumental altarpiece had indeed been removed from its prestigious location and relegated to a position near the crossing of the cathedral. In its place had been set up in 1506, a 15th century bronze tabernacle and expression of an increasing use of altar decoration with an overtly acoustic Cruciastic function. Sadly, however, this was by no means the end of the process of destroying the physical, iconographic, and aesthetic integrity of the Maesta. <clears throat> In 1771, the painting was stripped of its framing and pinnacle panels. The main panel was cut into seven vertical strips and the front separated from the back face by the panel being sewn apart, sawn apart. At this point, the slip of a saw severely damaged the face of the Virgin. Meanwhile, the per diem was cut into individual scenes and the pinnacle panels were drastically cut down. Thereafter, the surviving fragments of the altarpiece led a perceptic existence and although most of them, including the two main panels, are now displayed in the Museo del Operero del Duomo in Siena. Several of the subsidiary panels remain dispersed in art collections throughout the world, despite the near catastrophic history of the painting. The surviving parts of the Maesta have fortunately been the object of skillful conservation by modern restorers whose investigations have revealed much about the techniques of the 14th century panel painting and workshop practice. Duccio scholars have also subjected to the Maesta to intense archaeological and historical study and have offered a number of plausible hypotheses as to the original physical structure of this remarkable double-sided altarpiece and the extent and significance of its highly versatile iconography iconographic program, plate 67 and 68. The subject matter of the Maesta is outlined in the appendix at the end of this essay.
I'm going to go ahead and go back so that you can see the Maesta. And then if you can read, pause and read. <clears throat> and then I'm also going to try and get as close as possible. And then I'm going to zoom in on this so that you can see this as well. And then here is plate 68. <coughs> Excuse me. Of the several reconstructions, sorry about that. Of the several reconstructions of the Maesta attempted by modern scholars, the one that is the most attentive to both surviving physical and historical evidence is that of John White. On the basis of White Reconstruction, it appears that the work uh, was a vast double-sided altarpiece from 468 by 499 centimeters. In its overall dimensions, the front face of this huge edifice once displayed an imposing image of the Virgin and the Christ Child enthroned with angels and saints with a sequence of three-quarter length images of the apostles above plate 65 on the upper part of the altarpiece was a series of pinnacle panels rendered the more distinctive by their truncated gable shape which represented narrative events <clears throat> associated with the death of the virgin the sequence of the pin of pinnacle panels began with the narrative scene of the annunciation of the death of the virgin plate 73, and ended with the entombment of the Virgin, plate 67. Between these two scenes was located a series of further pinnacle panels, four of which survive and one of which is now probably lost. This missing pinnacle panel was probably a centrally placed painting of the Virgin Mary crowned as Queen of Heaven. The entire structure of the altarpiece was supported by a predella, a box-like structure which had both its front and back surfaces painted with further sequences of narrative scenes. The front face de depicted scenes from the infancy of Christ, beginning with the Annunciation, Plate 74, and ending with the disputation in the temple. These scenes being separated by paintings of prophets, Plate 67, the back face of the Perdia, once depicted scenes from the ministry of Christ, of which the opening scene is now lost. The closing scene in this series was probably the raising of Lazarus, plate 68. On the back face of the altarpiece itself were 26 scenes from the Passion of Christ, starting at the bottom left-hand corner with the entry into Jerusalem, plate 69, and ending at the top right-hand corner with the apparition on the road to Emos plate 66. The Christological cycle continued in a series of pinnacle panels that showed scenes depicting events of following Christ's resurrection. These begin with the apparition behind closed doors and, op and ended the with the Pentecost plate 68, the central scene now missing. May once have depicted the ascension with the, an image of Christ in majesty above it. Here is the plate 69. The composite physical structure of the altarpiece and its wide variety of religious subject matter imply support the assertion by White that the Maesta represents the richest and most complex altarpiece to have been created in Italy. It is the aim of this essay to examine and test this claim. In so doing, the essay will focus upon a number of salient features of the Maesta and its production. It will discuss the way in which the Maesta exemplifies a high degree of technical 
narrative, and representational skill on the part of its painters. Particular emphasis will be placed upon the organizational skill required of Duccio and members of his workshop in painting an altarpiece of this size and complexity. The essay will also consider with significant the significance of the original position of the Maesta over the high altar, a location at the very heart of the cathedral in lethargic, le, liturgical terms. Sorry. In so doing, it will focus upon a various ways in which the painting's complex iconographic program was highly appropriate to the altarpiece's original function as a monumental civic icon. The Commission. Two documentary records provide tantalizingly brief evidence of the circumstances surrounding this prestigious civic commission and the complex and long drawn out process of its execution. The earlier of the two documents dated 9 October 1308 records that the Sienese painter Duccio di Bonisegna sorry, had accepted from Jacobo di Marscotti, clerk of works operarius of the Opera del Duomo. The task of the painting, a certain panel to be placed on the high altar of the Church of St. Maria of Siena. Furthermore, Duccio promised Jacobo that he would not work in he would work continuously on the panel and not accept other work until he had completed it. Jacobo, in return, promised to pay Duccio 16 sol soldi for the, every day that the painter worked on the panel. For any day or part of a day that the painter did not work, an appropriate deduction would be made. In addition, he was to be paid a basic monthly salary of 10 lire. Jacopo also promised to supply Duccio with all those things which shall be needed for working of the said panel. The document ends by naming a sum of money as a penalty clause should either of the contracting parties default on their agreed commitments. The document also records that in order to make the agreement more solemnly binding, Duccio swore voluntarily on the holy gospel of God, physically touching the book that he would observe and implement everything in good faith and without fraud. A second document copied in the 19th century, but thought to date from 1308 to 9, records of the records records a further agreement concerning the amount that Duccio should be paid for the production of the back face of the altarpiece. The document indicates that the painting was to consist of 34 histories and little angels above. It further states that Duccio should be paid for as for if for 38 histories at a rate at of two and a half florins per history. Once again, Duccio was to be paid specifically for the task of painting the craft of the brush, unquote, and an unnamed clerk of works would provide the necessary materials. Duccio was to receive an immediate payment of 50 florins with the remainder of the payment being paid on a pro rate basis, history by history. These two documents supply useful insights into both the well-established legally binding procedures for the commissioning and production of 14th century art and the unusual nature and burden of this particular project. Commissions for 14th century works of art of the scale and degree of public prestige of the Maesta characteristically involved at least three sets of interested parties, the painter acting on behalf of his workshop, the commissioners, and other persons acting in a legal capacity on behalf of either the painter or the commissioners. We learned from the first document that the Opera del Duomo had delegated to one of its members the responsibility for dealing directly with Duccio and overseeing the painter's payment. We also learned that Duccio's accepted a legally binding contractual obligation on behalf of himself and his heirs. From the second document, we learned that two other individuals, one of them probably acting specifically on Duccio's behalf and the other on behalf of the opera, 
were employed to assess payment for the back of the double-sided altarpiece, a common procedure in 14th and 15th century Italy, for establishing fair payment for work done. Since the first of the documents is securely dated October 1308 and the altarpiece was installed in June 1311, the project clearly extended over a long period. Moreover, although Duccio scholars had generally thought that the document of the of October 1308 represented the initial contract, it has been pointed out that it makes no reference to the form and subject of the altarpiece, as was usual for a contract. It may, in fact, represent only an interim agreement referring back to an earlier and now lost contract. It is possible, therefore, that the work on Maesta began even earlier in, than 1308. Indeed, the 1308 document may be an endeavor by the opera to secure from Duccio a further guarantee of his wholehearted and exclusive commitment to the project. The two documents give an indication of two different styles of payment offered to 14th century artists. The pro rate rata basis for, pay, repay, for payment cited in the second document as Duccio's mode of payment for the histories on the back of the altarpiece was more usual. Clearly, the back of the Maesta, with its multiple scenes, lent itself to such an arrangement, plate 66 and 68, the front of the Maesta, by contrast with its large unified figural composition of the Virgin and Saints, could not easily be divided into pieces of distinct work. Plate 65 and 67, it was probably for this reason that the earlier document referred to a more complex procedure for paying Duccio. The painter was to receive <clears throat> a fixed monthly salary, but as a further incentive, he was also to receive extra payments for work done on a day-by-day -day, day -day basis. In general, pro rata payment was preferred. Since it was much easier for the patrons and commissioners to control th than the system of supervision, whereby the clerk of works had to keep a record of precisely how many days or parts of days day a painter worked on a commission. The second document also offers valuable evidence concerning what the back of the altarpiece was once comprised. What survives of this part of the altarpiece today is discounting the predelia scenes is 26 scenes on the main part of the panel, plate 66, and six pinnacle panels, plate 68. Since the agreement refers to 34 histories, it would therefore seem at first sight that White's inclusion of two lost narrative scenes as the centerpiece of the pinnacles panels is correct, plate 67 and 68. However, when compared with the contemporary Multi-tiered altarpieces, White's prop proposed centerpiece for the Maesta is unusually tall, chapter 9, plates 240 and 242. It is arguably more likely, therefore, that only one narrative scene was placed at the center of the pinnacle panels. The calculation of the 34 histories may have been made on the basis that certain scene of certain of the scenes, such as the crucifixion and the entry into Jerusalem, were of a larger format. The agreement also makes reference to little angels above, implying that above the pinnacle appears, appeared a sequence of angel panels. Four of these six panels depicting angels have been located, since the document also states that Duccio was to be paid as for 38 paintings in total. Payment for these single figure panels, one of which may well have been a central image of Christ in majesty, must have been calculated <clears throat> as equivalent to four narrative paintings. It is notable that neither of the documents refers to the predia of the altarpiece. It appears, therefore, that this particular feature was considered a discrete and separate part of the altarpiece design. Circumstantial confirmation of this is, uh, occurs in an entry in a cathedral inventory of 1423, in which two hangings are listed, one to cover the altar and the other to cover the predia. Although there 
is earlier evidence of the Pradillas being commissioned as part of altar pieces at this date, they still remained rel relatively rare. It is quite likely, therefore, that in 1308-9, the final form and subject matter of the Pradilla for the Maesta was still to be decided upon. If this was the case, we have further indication that this ambitious pro project gradually evolved over a period of time. The two documents also provide information on the cost of materials. In the case of Maesta, a large quantity of well-seasoned popular wood, gesso, gypsum, gold leaf, and pigments, and the cost of the labor, which could encompass many diverse and highly skilled tasks. When working on the earlier Ruchea Madonna, Duccio was paid for both painting materials and labor whereas for the Maesta, Duccio was apparently paid only for his labor. This does not necessarily mean, however, that Duccio worked alone with the, on the Maesta. The sheer ambition of the project and the collaborative nature of the 14th century artistic practice makes make this highly unlikely. The stipulation in both documents regarding Duccio's participation occurs specifically in relation to the conditions necessary for Duccio himself to receive payment. The implications of this are twofold. First, the financial re recompense of the master painter who, as head of a major project, was undoubtedly involved in organizing and directing other painters was a key concern to, of the Opera del Duomo. Secondly, Duccio's in individual expertise as an established master painter tried and tested on the civic projects both within Siena and in other city communes such as Florence and Perugia, was a highly valued and stood as guarantee for the overall quality of work. The construction the surviving 1285 contract for Ruccio Madonna indicates that Duccio received a ready-made panel on which to paint on the testimony of this contract and of later 14th century contracts for altarpieces. It is generally assumed that the complex structure of the Maesta must have been designed and built before the painting began. White, a staunch pro proponent of this view, observes that not one brush stroke can have been painted until the entire structure with its attendant processes of carpentry and clamping, nailing and gluing and gessoing had been completed. This view for the most part corresponds well with what is known about the preparatory stages of the 14th century panel painting in general and what has been discovered in respect of the Maesta. It is clear that unlike a modern painting, which is placed in its frame only after its completion, the complex framing of the Maesta was, it was attached to the panels before the paintings were executed. <clears throat> On one of the back Perdia panels, which still retains most of its original inner framing, is it is possible to observe how the moldings of the frame were nailed and glued to the surface of the panel, plate 70. In addition, due to the loss of gilding on both of the frames and of the panel, it is possible on the painting itself to see how a layer of linen canvas was glued to an, the entire surface of both panel and frame, layers of gesso then being applied to this canvas ground. Although the close integration of frame and panel on the Maesta demonstrates that the greater part of the altarpiece was assembled as a single structure prior to the to painting. Recent research undertaken by the National Gallery London has challenged the view that the entire work was assembled prior to painting. On the basis of a detailed examination of what survives of the slightly later high altarpiece by Ugolino di Nero for Santa Croce Florence, it has been suggested that the Maesta have been may have been carried to the cathedral in separate parts, the main panel, the pinnacle panels, and the pradilla, and then assembled the question of what provided the necessary stability for the massive structure of the altarpiece.
has likewise been the subject of debate among art historians. The box-like structure of the Perdia, projecting substantially in front and to the sides of the main panel, undoubtedly provided one stabilizing factor. While on the basis of his detailed examination of the Maesta and other early 14th century Tuscan altarpieces, <clears throat> purposes of that the Maesta at once possessed a wraparound frame which terminated at approximately two-thirds of the height of the pin pinnacle panels, white suggestions, is supported by surviving pieces of work as a polypitic painted by Duccio's workshop, plate 71, and a number of polypolitics produced by close contemporaries of the painter. It has been observed, however, that these examples represent relatively simple structures comprising no more than one thickness of panel, two or three tiers of paintings, and no predia. It has therefore been suggested that the Maesta was further supported and given added stability by two lateral buttresses, which had, which would have run down and been secured to the floor of the cathedral since such buttresses are standard feature of later 14th century altarpieces. With the Padilla, it is possible that the Maesta included these. Here is the pictures, and I'll try and get as close as possible so that you can read the. And then here's this one. And I'll try and get as close as I can so that you can read that. <clears throat> These architectonic features and may indeed itself have been markedly influential in the adoption of this aspect of the 14th century altarpiece. Chapter 9, Plate 256. Definitely beyond dispute is that the Maesta represented an architectonic enterprise that in terms of its scale and the variety of its component parts was remarkably ambitious a sense of the audacity of the Maesta may be gained by comparing it with earlier altarpieces. The Ruccile Madonna and the Agnesanti Madonna represents e examples of comparable height, yet their gable format is much more simple than the multiple tiers, varied framing, and Gothic pinnacles of the Maesta. Excuse me. Later pop polypitics offer examples of a multiplicity of subsidiary panels and pinnacles and yet lack the impressive overall scale of the Maesta, chapter 9, plates 240 and 242. Above all, they, they are not double sided. In fact, their double sided format of the Maesta was not without precedence. The dating of the early 14th century double-sided high altarpiece for St. Peter's Rome is controversial, but it was probably executed later than the Maesta. It has conceivably been argued that there was a late 13th century double-sided high altarpiece in San Francesco, Perugia. However, the Perugian altarpiece was relatively modest in scale, comprising only a series of small-scale, full-length painted figures on one side and narrative scenes alternating with standing figures on the other. The latter possibility of the, the inspiration for the front face of the Pedia of the Maesta, a partially precedent for the back of the Maesta, exists in altarpieces that characteristically portrayed an enthroned holy figure with the narrative scenes arranged on either side, plate 72. <clears throat> What was so extraordinary about the Maesta was it was it represented a high, highly sophisticated and analogam of all these different altarpieces for altarpiece formats. As the painter in charge of this imposing enterprise, would Duccio have been directly concerned with the details of the physical structure of the Maesta and its complex carpentry?
White argues that such is the ambition of the Maesta that its very manufacture required the mind of an artist such as Duccio to organize it into a cohesive and aesthetic whole. Plate 67 and 68. White therefore proposes that the entire design of the altarpiece was based upon a system of proportions whereby the measurements of the side and the diagonal of a square were used to generate a succession of larger or smaller squares. This relatively simple system had been devised by medieval masons and was commonly used in Europe throughout the 14th century. Duccio may well have been exercised a role in designing the physical structure of the altarpiece. It is also possible, however, that the necessary mathematical expertise was supplied not by Duccio, but by Sienese woodworkers. Experienced in the construction of three-dimensional objects, monumental in scale and well-proportioned in their constitu constituent parts, even if this was the case, the commission for the Maesta specifically required the portrayal of an extraordinary number of figures and narrative scenes in order to respond to such a demanding brief. Duccio undoubtedly had to think extremely carefully about the component parts of the altarpiece and how these were organized in relationship to one another. Close cons consultation with those directly responsible for the initial construction of the altarpiece would therefore have been essential. Such collaborative involvement in the realization of the precise specifications of the Maesta design would have been entirely plausible with it in the close-knit community of, the, of artistic practice, practitioners within early 14th century Siena. Workshop collaboration. It is generally agreed that the scale and ambition of the Maesta were such as to require the involvement of a number of different painters working upon it. Indeed, examination of different parts of the Maesta reveals markedly different approaches both to the representation of the figures themselves and to the spatial considerations in the locations in which they are portrayed. Such divergences of approach are strikingly apparent in two narrative scenes from the front face of the Maesta, which share broadly similar subjects, plates 73 and 74, in the Annunciation of the Death of the Virgin. Mary is represented sitting upon a tip-tilted seat. In addition, the seat is somewhat uneasily located in relation to the right-hand wall of the room in which it is situated, plate 73. Furthermore, the figure of the Archangel Gabriel overlaps the painted architectural architecture, thereby, thereby rendering insecure his position <clears throat> within the building. The Annunciation, by contrast, Gabriel is convincingly represented emerged emerging through an open archway and both he and Mary appear as if situated within the single coherent space. Defined by the painted architecture plate 74, the figural types are also markedly different in the two paintings. In the Annunciation, Mary and the Archangel are represented as tall slender figures and the Annunciation of the Death of the Virgin, they seem much bulkier in form and in particular, the modeling of the volumes of the heads is noticeably more heavy handed. Plate 73, similar discrepancies occur in the treatment of the architectural interiors of and figural groupings in such scenes as the app apparition of Christ at supper and the feast at Cana, CF plate 75 and 82. Likewise, the various cityscapes portrayed showed, show marked differences in the sophistication of their handing, handling, plate 69 and 76. When the Maesta is examined from the perspective, a common pattern begins to emerge. The painting of the Virgin and Christ child enthroned is not only of uniformly high quality, but also significantly innovative in its treatment of the Maesta theme, as befitted the principal image on the frontal face of the altarpiece, plate 65. By contrast, the pinnacle paintings on both the front and back of the altarpiece are markedly more conservative in their approach at first sight. 
No striking variation is readily apparent when the pinnacle paintings are compared with the series of narrative scenes of the passion on the back face of the altarpiece. However, a higher degree of incentives, incentiveness occurs within the lower half of the main panel than within the upper half. For example, the cityscape in the entry into Jerusalem and the two-storied edifice with its exterior staircase and enclosed courtyard in Christopher or I'm sorry, in Christ before Annas and the first denial of Peter are both notable for their ambitious approach to spatial representations. Plate 69 and 77, such sophistication of pictorial means is also apparent within the scenes on both the front and back faces of the Padilla. A number of proposals have been made to account for such discrepancies in styles. James Stubblebean, for example, has divided the Maesta into discrete areas and assigned each of these to specific 14th century pa painters, some of whom are documented as independent masters who worked on later commissions within the first half of the century. Stubblebine suggests that Duccio was only responsible for the main painting on the front face of the altarpiece, excluding the series of apostles above and the paintings on the front face of the Perdia on the basis of perceived similarities with securely documented paintings by other, by three other well-known Sienese painters, Simone Martini and Ambrosia and Pietro Lorenzetti. Stubblebean assigns responsible, responsibility for painting the back of the Perdia. The back pinnacle panels and a proportion of the narrative scenes on the back face of the altarpiece to these paint three painters. The pinnacle scenes on the front of the altarpiece he assigns to Sinia di Bonaventura, a painter whose documented activity suggests that he was slightly younger than Duccio. The sequence of the apostles on the front of the altarpiece he assigns to Ugolino di Nero, a painter who subsequently executed the high altarpiece for Santa Cruz, Florence. Finally, Stubblebeam assigns the angel pa panels <clears throat> and the remainder of the narrative scenes on the back of the altarpiece to three other painters, none of whom can be identified by name and whose other works remain solely within the realm of the scholarly uh, attribution. White, by contrast, argues strongly that no such parceling out of work into discrete separate entities occurred. He rightly emphasized that the 14th century painting practice was based upon closely collaborative patterns of work. In his view, several individuals might have worked on a single narrative scene, each deploying his particular skills. He therefore attributes control of the entire project to Duccio with the unnamed collaborators contributing only according to the master's painter's dis dis direction. White proposes a fairly rapid sequence of work from top to bottom, beginning with the back pinnacle scenes and then in sequence in fr the front pinnacle scenes of the upper part of the back of the altarpiece, the lower part of the back of the altarpiece, the front main panel of the altarpiece, the front perdia scenes, and finally, the back perdia scenes. By proposing such a sequence of work, White largely accounts <clears throat> for the perceptible changes of style from one part of the maesta to another in terms of a kind of stylistic progress from top to bottom with Duccio and his assistants learning as they went and becoming progressively more confident as they worked down the surface of this monumental painting. Here is the pictures and I'll try and get as close as I can so you can see detail as well as the inscription of each. Excuse me.
The views of both scholars are predicted on the maesta being executed in a time span of some two years and seven months. Given that the maesta represents an enormously ambitious scheme of paintings, this would have necessitated fairly rapid execution, part, particularly if the workshop was also working concurrently on other commissions. Stubbelin account, accounts for such speed of execution by assigning the work to Duccio and eight other painters. White accounts for it in terms of an enormously energetic campaign of work ana analogous to a fresco the scheme. As already noted, the campaign on the Maesta may well have occurred over a longer period, a longer time period, allowing for the complex collaborative patterns of work suggested by White to occur in a more measured way. White's model was closely collaborate closely collaborative work becomes even more per persuasive when the results of modern technical in investigations of the Maesta are taken into account. The evidence of one such technical investigation undertaken the National Gallery London and focused on the healing of the, bl the blind man offers valuable insight into how patterns of collaboration once worked and how in any given painting adjustments and, and changes in, in, in direction might occur, plate 78. An array of modern scientific techniques, X radiography, infrared reflectography, the use of tape of raking light it was used to reveal the procedures employed once the panel had been gessoed the circum circumference of Christ's halo was incised with a metal stylus upon the surface of the Jeff gesso ground precisely at the center of the panel. Next, the figures of the greatest religious importance and narrative si significance, Christ, Peter, and Paul, in the group on the left, and the two figures of the blind men on the right, were drawn in. In order to indicate where the base of the architecture would be, should be, a thick dark stroke of paint or ink was conf confidently added to the left of the blind man at the fountain, which can be seen at the far right of the finished painting. Then the general area of the figure group on the left was roughly indicated but not given any detail. After these initial states of design had been complete, completed by a first painter, in all probability, Duccio himself, the design and planning of the painting was apparently taken over by a second painter who drew in the architectural background of the city of the of Bethsaida, Mark 822. Straight lines were accordingly incised on the onto the surface of the gessoed panel and frequently extended further than was required for the final painted architectural forms. Thus, mark it, the moldings that form the arcade of the upper floor were established by three continuous ruled lines, which extend across the open arches in the center of the building on the left. At this stage, Duccio probably intervened again, adding extra decorative details such as the lunette of the door above Christ's head and the capitals of the door between the two versions of the blind man. These additional details were in fact later ignored by the painter of the architecture. <clears throat> they have become visible due to the increased transparency of the paint over the years. The group of apostles was then drawn in, apparently by a less competitive competent painter than Duccio. Therefore, the architecture was painted very meticulously with the edges of blocks of color precisely abuting ab one another. The main architectural lines were then incised in order to re reinforce the empathetic linear quality of the painted buildings. The figures were then painted on, and the foreground defiled in the, with a distinctive cross-hatched stroke which may again have been Duccio's own.
Meanwhile, the pose of the blind man apparently underwent several transitions. Initially, the figure was drawn as if bending over the fountain in order to reinforce the narrative point that the mir miracle was conducted by his action of washing his eyes. John 9, 7. However, even before the head was drawn, this pose was abandoned and replaced by a representation of the blind man standing and gazing upwards. It has plausibly been suggested that the decision was taken because it provided a narrative link between the scene, the transfiguration, the next scene on the back face of the Pradia, plate 68 and, and 70. The blind man was, as a result of this alteration, represented looking up at Christ, appearing in his divine glory at the moment of transfiguration, conceivably when Duccio came to execute the design for the transfiguration. He saw the potential of this iconic, iconographic link and adjusted the post of the blind man accordingly. Furthermore, the blind man's right arm was never drawn in at all, but merely executed in paint over the already painted building behind the figure such an alteration represents additional evidence of Duccio's essentially pragmatic and resourceful approach to painting. It appears that the painter changed the pose in order to disguise a fault on the surface of the panel just visible below the elbow of the figure. The result conveys very well the sense of the blind man rejoicing in the restoration of his sight and gesturing before the visionary scene in the adjacent painting, 68 and 67, or I'm sorry, in 78. In addition, the blind man was originally drawn with bare feet and his stockings added only at the painting stage. The reconstruction of this order of work on a single panel reveals very clearly the collaborative nature of the enterprise. It also suggests that the process of the painting of the Maesta proceeded in an empirical way and was const constantly subject to change of minds and adjustment. These were often made, as in the case of the blind man, in order to enrich the iconographic and devotional content of the painted scheme, if Duccio's hand can be detected in the drawing and the painting of both the most important figures, and particularly enlivening details on this single Pradia panel, it sh would appear that he did indeed control the project and, as the work progressed, was constantly intervening and refining upon his collaborators' contribute contributions. I think I put this one, but just in case, I'm going to go ahead and show this. Now that after reading, you can see. Although document, uh, location and iconography. Although documentary and material factors offer offer plausible evidence of Duccio's close personal supervision of the construction and painting of the Maesta. The question of responsibility for the choice of subject matter and its treatment remains more con conjectural. The documents for the commissioning of the Maesta make only very generalized reference to its highly complex subject matter and offer no indication at all of who was responsible for its choice. Given the prestigious nature of the Maesta, it is legitimate to see this aspect of the altarpiece's design as firmly within the remit of the commune and the bishop of Siena. Ne Siena. Nevertheless, it was also undoubtedly the case that the communal and ecclesiastical authorities value Duccio's personal skill in representing the kinds of religious image and narrative required for this ambitious conceived altarpiece. Once again, it appears that the Maesta represents the outcome of collaboration on this occasion between the communal and ecclesiastical authorities and the painter in order to appreciate fully the, re the force of, sex of such a conjectured
collaboration, it is necessary to consider in more detail the painting's design designated location over the high altar of the Siena and the significance of this location. So I will get as close as I can and then I will zoom in so you can see this. This has a lot of detail. And here is the plate 80. At the time of the painting of the Maesta, the cathedral was a more modest edifice than its subsequently than it subsequently became in the second half of the 14th century. The crossing existed in its present hexagonal form, but the transepts and the chancel were on a much reduced scale. The chancel was rectangular in shape, only three bays wide and two bays deep. It had on its wall, end wall an oculus, which contained a fine late 13th century stained glass window, sometimes attributed to Duccio, plate 79, and probably three lancet windows below. The dark green and white marble facing of the walls of the cathedral effectively prohibited fresco paintings or mosaics. The complex narratives, uh, si narrative cycles of the Maesta can at one level be accounted for by this lack of other pictorial decoration. However, the facade of the cathedral was already richly embellished with Giovanni Pisano's sculpted figural program. Moreover, in close vicinity to the high altar, as may be seen on a 15th century painted book cover, plate 80 stood Nicola Pisano's mid 13th century carved pulpit. This pulpit, the pulpit itself, before a sequence of six narrative reliefs, which depicted scenes from the infancy and the passion of Christ, as well as the last judgment. On the basis of a documentary reference made in 15, 1259 to the canons choir being placed beneath the dome of the cathedral, it has generally been assumed that the high altar and the maesta were set up on the east side of the crossing but the choir stall stand arranged somewhat haphazardly around them however it was it has recently been pointed out that this particular reference to the placement of the choir represents the expression of only one point of view in a debate conducted by the Cancio della campagna in 1259 a document of 1368 which deals with the the construction of new choir stalls suggests that the 13th century choir had been built in straight lines. It seems much more likely, therefore, that the high altar was located on the first bay of the chancel of the choir with the choir stalls built behind it as two rows facing each other in a uniform rectangular shape, plate 81. What is crucial about such an arrangement is that the maesta must have stood between the part of the cathedral accessible to the lately and that part accessible only to the clergy. Moreover, its front face with its celebration of Mary as mother of Christ and queen of heaven, the events of the directed of the incarnation and the last days of vir the Virgin would have been directed towards the lay audience Meanwhile, the Christological scenes of the ministry, passion, and post-resurrection appearances of Christ on the back face of the altarpiece would have been exclusive preserved of the cathedral canons performing their daily offices within the choir. The Maesta was not the first altarpiece to, to grace the high altar of the Siena Duomo, well before the festive installation of Duccio's painting, the high altarpiece had become a focal point of civic and popular devotion.
the dedication of Siena the, to the Virgin in 1260 took place in front of the early 13th century painted relief depicting the Virgin and Child enthroned, known partly as the Madonna Daji Ochi Grossi, Our Lady of the Big Eyes, which then stood on the high altar of the cathedral. This carved altarpiece was in the form of a rectangular panel with the central relief of the of Mary and her son framed by a series of narrative reliefs on either side. It appears that shortly after 1260, it was replaced by a more contemporary painted panel of the Virgin and Christ Child framed by saints, which probably took the form of a rectangular gabled panel this later 13th century altarpiece was in turn cut down and become a popular votive object preserved in its own chapel and still today brought out every year to be placed upon the high altar as part of the celebrations of the feast of the assumption 15 august and the paleo Paleo, in place of these horizontal panels, which were undoubtedly modest in scale, format, and construction, Duccio gave his civic patrons a much more ar architectonic structure ex equipped with such novel features as a predia based and possibly sturdy buttresses. The traditional association of the high altarpiece with Siena's civic fortunes <clears throat> was preserved by Duccio and Maesta on the basis of the Virgin Thrones it, Virgin's Throne is painted a painted text which reads in translation Holy Mother of God be thou the cause of peace for Siena and because he painted thee thus for of life for Duccio the votive nature of this painted inscription Scription is further emphasized by the four saints kneeling in the foreground whose posture and hand gestures underline their significance as intermediaries between the painting's audience and the Virgin. They are moreover identified by both figural type and inscription as the four patron saints of Siena, Ansonius, Sabinus, Crescentius, and Victor. Further elaborating upon his earlier treatment of the subject of the Virgin enthroned in majesty in the Ruccelli Madonna, Duccio portrayed the, oh, my goodness gracious, oh no, I'm fine, portrayed the Virgin in the Maesta as tenderly maternal and yet also immensely regal. She is seated upon a monumental marble throne, which in terms of its material splendor must once have reflected the interior embellishment of the cathedral. In addition, the Virgin appears not merely with attendant angels, but with a whole company of saints whose graceful poses and richly colored and exquisitely decorated garments, plate 64, contribute to a powerful evocation of a ceremonial and courtly setting. The impression given is that the Virgin is queen, not only of heaven, but also of Siena. The wholehearted celebration of the Virgin, which lay at the very center of the 14th century, Sienese civic religion, undoubtedly also dictated the choice of subject matter for the front surface of the Perdia and the front pinnacle panels. The six Perdia scenes from the infancy of Christ as recounted in the Gospels according to Matthew and Luke naturally provided a vehicle for the Virgin's role in the incarnation and the birth of Christ. Plate 67. Similarly, the pinnacle scenes of the last days of the Virgin further glorified her unique religious significance. This significant... I'm sorry, the sequence of events as recounted in such late medieval texts as the 13th century golden legend by Jacobus de Vorhean was believed to have presented a close analogy to the events of Christ's resurrection and the ascension into heaven. Moreover, it should be recalled that Siena Duomo, 
was itself dedicated to the Virgin of the Assumption. Furthermore, directly above the Maesta, when viewed from the body of the cathedral, would have appeared to appeared the stained glass oculus with its sequence of images directly reiterating the cathedral's Marian dedication. By contrast, the extensive narrative series on the back of the Maesta is not principally toward, directed towards such marological concerns at one level. It describes in great detail Christ's ministry and passion as recounted in all four Gospels, plate 66 and 68. The epic story of Christ's sacrifice on the cross and his resurrection, the climax of the Christian drama of redemption, is therefore central to the painted series within this narrative cycle. Moreover, a number of scenes may well have been chosen for their particular relevance to the celebration of Mass, itself understood to be a symbolic reenactment of both the Last Supper and the Crucifixion. The largest scene of all on the back of the altarpiece is the crucifixion, plate 66. Directly below it, at the center of the back of the Perdia, appears the feast at Cana, at which Christ was believed to have miraculously turned water into wine. The miracle story was often inter interpreted as prefiguration of the Mass, plate 68 and 82. If the canon's choir behind the high altar included a subsidiary altar for the communal celebration of mass by the canons, then such specifically acoustic symbolism was particularly op op opposite, quite apart from the potentially acoustic imagery. However, the many scenes of the ministry passion and resurrection of Christ would in any case have provided a sequence of images upon which the canons would me mediate between during the performance of their offices. Ecclesiastic imagery was not however exclusively com confined to the back face of the altarpiece. The front face of the maesta was designed to be viewed in the context of the high altar at which on feast days, high mass would be celebrated. The portrayal of the presentation in the presentation of, in the temple at the very center of the predia of the Christ child, shown as he is in the arms of the high priest, would ha also have had strong acoustic, acoustic associations, since it was believed that at every celebration, the mass of the wafer in the hands of the officiating priest meticulously became the body of Christ, plate 67 and 83, the depiction of the altar with its intricate textile hanging and cherubim, broadly similar, similar in style to high altar chibrora in contemporary Italian churches acted as a further allusion to the lit liturgy of the mass, which took place upon the altar directly below the painting. <coughs> Excuse me. Here is plate 81, and this shows the altarpiece and where it hung. And then here is plate 82. And I'll try and get as close as I can to this. Sorry about that. So you can see all the details. Okay. And then here is plate 83. Sorry. Try and do a zoom so you can kind of see the overall picture of it. It's kind of hard to see in black and white, I know, guys. Narrative organization and continuity. As master in charge of very ambitious of a very ambitious series of paintings to which were required to fulfill a number of specific liturgical 
and devotional functions, Duccio was presented with a daunting task in terms of thematic and formal organization. In this respect, the front face of the altarpiece must have provided a somewhat easier prospect since the principal part of the painted painted surface was taken up by the great iconic image of the Virgin and Christ Child enthroned. Plate 65. Duccio placed the narrative scenes of the infancy of Christ and the last days of the Virgin in two series at the bottom and the top of the altarpiece. They followed, for the most part, a sequential order that the corresponded broadly to the time-honored convention in Western art of reading the narratives over time from left to right. The exceptions are the now lost paintings of the coronation of the Virgin and the Virgin of the Assumption, which were placed centrally because of their greater religious significance. Whereas in a mural cycle such as the one in the arena chapel, the line of the narrative follows a downward movement from the top to the bottom of the wall. On both faces of the Maesta, the narrative has been arranged to be read from the bottom of the altarpiece to the top, plate 67-68. Duccio was thus able to place the scenes of Mary's death and the Assumption and Christ's post-resurrection appearances and the Ascension symbol symbolically closer to heaven. The temporal dimensions implied by such organization was further underlined by the introduction on the front face of the Perdia of a sequence of Old Testament prophets, each of whom holds a painted text that relates to the scene from Christ's infancy immediately to the prophet's right, plate 67 and 83. The intention behind this arrangement was that the scenes of the incarnation of Christ were seen as fulfilling a pr the promise of the Old Testament. One of the ways in which Duccio successful, or, I'm sorry, skillfully provided a sense of continuity within this complex and potentially dis disparate pictorial narrative was by scrupulous observance of unity of place. Thus, the first four scenes of the last days of the Virgin all take place in the same wooden beamed house, plate 67 and 73. In this pinnacle series, the individual apostles appear in robes and mantles of the same colors as, which, as those in which they are shown in the Passion series on the back of the altarpiece, a rather telling example of Duccio seeking to indicate the passage of time between events that took place during the life of Christ and the Virgin's subsequent death is supplied by the detail of a youthful, clean-shaven John in the healing of the blind man having acquired a light beard when portrayed at the head of the Virgin's bier in the fire in the funeral procession of the Virgin, plates 76 and 78. The highly skillful organization of the narratives on the front and back faces of the Perdia is also particularly striking. The Annunciation on the front face of the Perdia, the portrayal of the Archangel Gabriel actively entering through an archway offers a strong sense of beginning of a narrative, plate 67 and 74. In the presentation in the temple, the Cereborium, and the placing of the figures on either side of it provide a stable, centralized composition for the midpoint of the Perdia. Just to the left and right of the Cereborium, one catches a glimpse of a vaulted bay, an architectural feature that is taken up in the last scene on the front of front face of the Perdia where the young Jesus is shown discoursing with the elders in the temple, plate 83 and 84, a painted detail that offer a, offers a further sense of continuity to the narrative as a whole. It has generally been assumed that due to the significance as a prefiguration of the Christian rite of baptism, the baptism of Christ would have been the now lost initial scene on the back face of the Perdia. However, since the baptism often
occurred in cycles of imagery designed to celebrate the cult of St. John the Baptist, there remains the strong possibility that this first scene instead depicted in the temptation of Christ in the desert of the, by the devil, Matthew 4, 1 through 4, an accurate reflection of the now lost scene of the Maesta may be provided by the temptation in the desert on a mid 14th century Sienese painted triptych. A work that mirrors in detail many of the narrative scenes of the Maesta, plate 85. If so, then the narrative on the back face of the Padilla would have begun with a painting of two figures facing one another, which would have formed a figural composition broadly similar to the rising of the raising of Lazarus at the other end of the back of the Padilla, plate 86. As regards overall, <clears throat> organization, the narrative scenes on the back face of the Pradia, plate 68, would probably once have comprised three sets of three. Each set would have had its centerpiece as a painting with a central focus to it, plate 70, 82, and 93. The figural composition of the raising of Lazarus would learn, would then have provided a visually satisfying closure to the sequence as a whole, plate 68 and 86. In purely iconographic terms, this painting of the miraculous prefiguration of Christ's resurrection would also have provided a highly appropriate introduction to the Passion series situated above. The Passion series, like that of the back of the Perdia below, it represents a recess recension of all four gospel accounts. It is a much more ambitious sequence than those of the Perdia and Pinnacle panels and various <coughs> excuse me, proposals have been put forward as, it, as to its intended order. The most plausible of these being those of the White and Florence Dutrar both scholars suggest that the sequence should be read in from the lower left-hand corner, beginning with the entry into Jerusalem. The narrative proceeds thereafter in a left-to-right direction, first across the lower half of the painting and then left-to-right again across the upper half of the painting. It does not, however, follow a simple linear sequence within each of the two halves, but rather a bostra Fidonic pattern that is, <coughs> excuse me, to say a pattern of disposition combining both vertical and horizontal sequences within it, plate 87. Such patterns were common in the narrative sequences of stained glass windows in Northern Europe. Plate 88, the attractiveness of such a sequential order is that it is repetitive and orderly, but also highly flexible, allowing for more than one kind of directional reading. Indeed, it appears that Duccio deliberately sought to exploit the multi-directional possibilities of such an arrangement. Whereas White proposes a continuous bostrophedonic pattern throughout the two halves of the painting, Duccio suggests that several such patterns were devised around a central vertical axis, which incorporated three key scenes of both narrative and symbolic importance. The Agni of in the Garden of the Gethsemane, the betrayal of Judas, Judas and the, cru that, the crucifixion. Although White's proposal allows for a fairly scrupulous adherence to the order, just making sure I didn't miss anything. To the order of the gospel of accounts, it means that the narrative in the lower half of the painting ends on a downward alignment, which does not match the upward alignment to, at the end of the narrative in the upper half of the painting. It also appears to run counter to the figural and spatial compositions of both the scene of the entry into Jerusalem and the combined scenes of Christ before Annas and the first denial of Peter, plate 68 and 77. On the whole, therefore, Duchler's proposed sequence of a narrative 
appears to be more plausible, plate 87, although it involves certain liberties with the biblical text, such as the introduction of the cockerel in the scene of Peter's second denial, it more readily complements the main compositional flow of the lower half of the painting. Moreover, as Duchler points out, by adopting such a, an arrangement, it is possible to perceive a logical progression of steps for the design of the whole of the back of the maesta beginning with the largest and most important scene of the crucifixion in the upper half of the panel and then ordering the other scenes th accordingly around this key central painting as one of the front of the maesta continuity of costume and place is scrupulously observed other formal considerations provide further insights into the decree, degree of care taken over the, for the effect of the painting as a whole. Every narrative scene is shown as if lit from a source on the left. This constant fall of light from left to right further assists in the broad movement of the narrative from left to right across the panel within the constant consistent portrayal of light. There are, however, subtle variations appropriate to different times of the day. Thus, in the evening, seen the entombment of the Virgin, the main face of the tomb is deep, warm pink, and the contrast between the, the lit and shadowed surfaces of the medium gray rocks is not greatly differentiated. In the Marys at the tomb, the cooler light of dawn is suggested by the light of pink of the tomb and a stronger contrast between the surfaces of the rocks that are lit and those that are in the shadow. Finally, despite the restricted palette characteristic of 14th century panel painting, the organization of color is strikingly well balanced throughout. For example, Duccio and his assistants used the limited color range available to them included a skillful exploitation of bluish blues and reds the virgin enthroned and christ child the rich resonant blue of mary's mantle strikingly draws attention to her status as princi principal cult figure similarly the vivid reds deployed on the costumes of the standing and kneeling saints emphasize their prominence within the hierarchic scheme of the painting. Plate 65, the use of vibrant colors also sets the tone for the front and back faces of the Perdia and becomes, if anything, more striking within Passion series, where various shades of red predominate, both in the costume of the figures and in the architecture. Here are the pictures because this last paragraph cuts off. So I'm going to try to get as close because there is quite a bit detail. And then I'll get the overall. <clears throat> As suggested above, it is highly likely that the civic and ecclesiastical authorities of Siena specifically ex expected Duccio to represent hallowed religious images and narrative scenes in a manner that was conventional and yet innovative in form. It becomes apparent just how imaginatively Duccio responded to such expectations. It, the Maesta is compared to, with two examples of late 13th century Sienese painting, plate 72 and 89, which themselves combined, combined both representation of a holy figure and scenes replete with narrative incident on the one hand, he continued to adhere it to essentially Byzantine pictorial conventions, whilst on the other hand, 
He extended the expressive range and possibilities of such conventions. For example, he continued to adopt the pictorial convention of represent representing a landscape setting in the form of a number of schematically rendered rocks. Yet, if the 13th century version of the calling of Peter and Andrew is compared with the Maya, that of Maesta, it is at once apparent how in the latter of the rocky background has been used much more effectively to accommodate and com complement the key actor in this narrative drama, plates 90 and 91. Similarly, whilst, whilst in his entry into Jerusalem, the 13th century painter Giotto, Gui, I'm sorry, Guido de Siena was able to convey a sense of landscape setting and an implied progression from foreground to background in his portrayal of the scene. Duccio supplied a much more convincing illusion of a hilltop town. This is a setback at a distance from the immediate foreground and approached by a steeply inclined and paved road and is a town moreover that offers a convincing sense of accommodating both people and buildings. See a plate 69 to 89. Likewise, the representation of the interiors and exteriors of individual buildings in the Maesta tends to be far less schematic in, than in earlier Sienese paintings, for example, plates 72 and 74. Considering the treatment of the human form, it again appears that Duccio and his assistants both learned from and improved upon their predecessors. If the two versions of the calling of Peter and Ender are more once more compared, it is possible to see how the earlier version provided a model for the concise portrayal of a dramatic encounter between figures. With details of the background exploited to make such an encounter the more telling, plates 90 and 91, in Duccio's version, the three figures are rendered in such a way as to give much stronger sense of the volume of bodies and the emotion that each figure is experiencing is more subtly portrayed than the rather overwrought mood conveyed in the earlier painter's representation. As the previous paragraphs demonstrate, Duccio was clearly aware of the work of his 13th century predecessors and their debt to Byzantine art he was also indebted to the precedents derived from Northern Gothic art, especially that of France. Indeed, within the Maesta, it has proved possible to discern the creative interplay between the, these two influences upon Duccio's art. It appears from the infrared photography and the X-radiography of the rising of Lazarus, plate 86, that the figure of Lazarus was first represented arising diagonally from a low horizontally placed sarcophagus. This pictorial icono iconography was co common in Northern Gothic art, plate 88. <clears throat> Although it was also occasionally present in the 13th century Italian art, the decision was subsequently taken <clears throat> to portray the sarcophagus in a traditional Byzantine format as a vertical rock cut tomb with Lazarus in his white burial bands framed within it. This revision prompted the introduction of gabled tomb lid with two graves attendants to support it. It has rightly been noted both that the vertical tomb format probably derived from Byzantine manuscript illuminations and was characteristically featured in 13th century Sienese paintings of this subject, and that the earlier version was in many ways more inventive. There was, however, a strict compositional mo motivation for the decision to opt for the older, less innovative depiction in terms of the overall composition of the back face of the Perdia, the vertically placed rock tomb, which frames the upright figures of Lazarus, provides an emphatic closure to the last scene on the back of the Perdia.
Even in this one feature of a single panel, therefore, we see the subtle interplay between the meticulous attention to detail to and concern for the overall conception that was characterized of, oh, that was characteristic of Duccio's orchestration of the Maesta as a whole. Here is, and then I'll get closer so that you can see the details. And then here is plate 90. And then here is plate 91. And again, it's hard to tell in black and white. Conclusion. <clears throat> and then I'll go ahead and scroll in a little. Conclusion. How then can the achievement of the Maesta be best be summarized? Not surprisingly, local at least, locally at least, the Maesta inspired copies and imitations we know of at least two versions reduced in scale and less technically assured but unambiguously inspired by and indebted to the Maesta. The first generally attributed to a close associated of Duccio was executed for the Cathedral of Ma Massa Maritime some 10 years after the completion of the Maesta. Plate 92, the second generally attributed to a Sienese painter working in the mid 14th century, takes the form of a large triptych, Plate 85. Such copies no notwithstanding, it is clear that this extraordinary double-sided altarpiece could not easily be emulated. The triptych replicated only imagery from the front face of the Pradilla and the back face of the altarpiece of the Maesta. The Massa Maritime altarpiece, although double-sided, con constituted a much simplified version of both the front and back faces of the Maesta. Local imitations aside, what of the more diffused influence of the Maesta? A double-sided altarpiece was painted by close associates of Giotto for the high altar of the of St. Peter's in Rome, probably in the second or third decade of the 14th century, at the behest of Cardinal Stefan, Stefan Yeshi. Like the Maesta, its format, I'm sorry, its its format and iconography appear to have been dictated by its original ecclesiastical location over a high altar, behind which was a canon's choir and below which it was believed lay the tomb of St. Peter. Yet despite its highly prestigious location, this double-sided altarpiece was much more modest than the Maesta in terms of scale and iconography. Indeed, in sheer scale and iconographic complexity, the Maesta was to return, I'm sorry, to remain unique. A com comparably ambitious narrative scheme was never again attempted within the field of Italian panel painting. It is only in the realm of the 14th century mural painting that a similar degree of sophistication can be found. By contrast, in at least two other respects, the Maesta proved profoundly influential. The broad, expansive figural composition of the Virgin and the Christ Child enthroned became a marked feature of the subsequent handling of the Maesta theme by Sienese artists. Similarly, the multi-tiered design of the front face of the Maesta it was widely used by other Sienese painters commissioned to produce altarpieces for prestigious Tuscan and Umbrian churches. Particularly influential examples of such diffusion include the high altarpiece pieces executed by the Uglino di Nero for Santa Croce, Florence, and by Simone Martini for Santa Caterina.
Pisa, Chapter 9, Plate 242. It is appropriate to end by focusing once more upon the maesta itself, and in particular upon one recurring, recurring detail of its painted narrative. In this one detail, many of the concerns and achievements encompassed within this extraordinary altarpiece are cumulatively expressed. The ambitious narrative cycle within the Maesta require, required the repeated representation of the temple in Jerusalem, such was Duccio's grasp of his overall narrative plan, that at different points he was able to provide both a series of recognizable representations of the temple and also a number of varied aspects of its architectural style and decor. In this temptation on the temple, the building was daringly represented as white octagonal structure on one side, of which is shown as parallel to the front surface of the painting. Plate 93. The close viewpoint thus afforded facilitates appreciation of the way in which the painter has portrayed a building constructed of rich and splendidly crafted matters, materials, per periphery, and s serpentine panels on the balcony elaborate brackets, gothic tracery in the windows, double columns. The painting even allows a glimpse of an interior with an inlaid pavement and complex vaulting supported on slender columns. From this one close-up view, it is possible to identify the same octagonal building within the cityscapes of Jerusalem in the entry into Jerusalem and the funeral procession of the Virgin, plates 69 and 76. Taking a cue from the interior view of the temptation on the temple, it is possible to see how the temple's well-appointed architectural feature also recur in the paintings of the presentation in the temple and the disputation in the temple on the front face of the Perdia, plates 83 and 84. So here is the plate 93. I'm going to try and get as close to this as possible because this is one of the plates. Okay. It has been suggested that the distinctive features of the of Duccio cityscape and the entry into Jerusalem can constitute constitute an attempt on the painter's part to represent albeit and contemporary form and pr form the principal buildings of Jerusalem as described in the Jewish war by the first century Jewish author Flavius Josephus, plate 69. This may or may not have been the case, although it must be said that there is no other evidence that Duccio had such a text in mind. In respect the, of the detailed representation of the temple, however, there was already a well-established iconographic tradition that the temple was octagonal in shape. For this reason, Italian medieval baptistries frequently adopted just such an architectural form. Likewise, Duccio's depiction of Jerusalem is gen generically similar to the appearance of the hill town of the 14th century Siena. <clears throat> it was a well-developed feature of the Sienese civic ideology that Siena was the second Jerusalem, a belief further nurtured by the city's placing of itself under the divine protection of the Virgin. It was a common aspect of medieval piety that people should envisage, envisage events described in the Bible and other religious texts as taking place within their own environments, the portrayal of Jerusalem in such a way as to suggest the appearance of Siena would have facilitated this devotional practice. The fact that the temple on the Maesta was reminiscent of the architecture of Siena Duomo further tied the imagery of the altarpiece to the official liturgy liturgical and civic rituals that took place at the cathedral's high altar.
Moreover, because the exterior view of the temple took the familiar outline of a typical Tuscan baptistry, the altarpiece also expressed a personal and essentially private dimension by reminding worshipers of their own baptisms and the promise of personal salvation embodied within them. It is surely impressive, this impressive combination of coherent organization and inventive versatility that which extended throughout every aspect of the altarpiece's structural and pictorial design that makes the Maesta deserving indeed of the accolade, the richest and most complex altarpiece to have been created in Italy. This is the end of chapter three. Thank you.